Hello and welcome to the Hurling Show. Myself, Shane Stapleton, and Michael Verney joining me as ever. It was another one of those manic, crazy hurling weekends. It's back, baby. Uh, <laughs> Dublin with the absolute result of the weekend. Brilliant performance against uh, Galway, winning 118 to 114. Tips off, Claire. That's where the drama will start. Limerick's off, Cork. Uh, there was results all down through the tiers. And maybe Kilkenny are back as well. But Michael Verney, what a weekend of hurling. Yeah, you've done your best, Damon Dunphy, there. It's back, baby. <laughs> Uh, it was an unbelievable weekend, wasn't it? Uh, uh, just the, the drama in Crow Park on, on Saturday night, it, it was just ebbing and flowing. You didn't know what way it was going to go. And then, obviously, yesterday, um, the, hur the hurling was brilliant, uh, but it's almost overshadowed by, by the James Owens decision. But there was just so much good over the weekend. And you're always looking for a shock as well. And I don't think there are very few, me and you included, with the best one in the world, could have said that, that Dublin were going to upset Galway like they did. And for Galway to score, you know, 114, like that, Galway were putting up more than that in a half of league hurling, you know, a month ago. And then all of a sudden, like it's just, we kind of said it the whole way through. The first couple of weeks of the, the league were a bit stuttery and there was no rules. But it was always, you know, ready to expl explode. It was just bubbling under the surface. And by Jesus, has it exploded now. Um, you wouldn't have said, like, Dublin, Kilkenny, you just, you just, few, very few, if any, with the best will in the world, would have predicted that as a Leinster final. And uh, it was just so much to look forward to. And even the teams in the back door, there's so many questions about them as well, let alone the teams going through the front door. It was just, uh, it just came to life. Yeah, I did. Like you, we're looking at Galway, Cork, uh, Waterford, Wexford, Leash, Antrim. I mean, the, I, I think I've forgotten somebody in there. You said to me off air, Shane. Clear. You're right. You'd nearly forget that Waterford are still in the championship. It's just like, so much happened over the weekend, and like they're they're just in the background now at the moment, and they're going to be in the foreground again fairly soon. But it's just brilliant, like. And they've had a nice bit of time to sort of wait in the wings to get themselves right again. And Liam Cattle will hope that his players are ready to go. Just a reminder, we're brought to you by orgaretro.com. I'm down in Cork at the moment, so uh, I forgot my jersey. I'd have it on. I'd have the big Cork jersey on, maybe. You have the, the lovely Mayo one on. But uh, get 15% off the orgaretro.com jerseys uh, using the promo code or a game. Uh, get your comments in, too. They're already streaming in. A reminder, if you want to get this as an audio podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash our game. And uh, you can get it there. It's the only place you can get the audio podcast. And if you also want to do a club fundraiser this year, you can do it with our game. Email in at events at our game.ie. So, Michael Verney, no like, there's nowhere else to start, only the clear against Tipperary. Now, the comments are already streaming in here. They're absolutely flying in. And we will certainly get to them pretty soon. Has Adrian but McGrath got to you yet? He's surely in with an early one this morning, is he? Yeah, he's a massive Clare fan and, you know, he's been hammering me hard ever since the game yesterday. It feels I didn't make enough of the penalty decision where Aaron Shanahan and Barry Heffernan wrestled each other to the ground. We'll come to that one first, but, or in a little bit. But to me, right, OK, so obviously Aidan McCarthy took Jake Morris out. I think he took him out massively cynically. I took, think he just decided this man is good. like, Murray, yeah, I'll go for lunch for the ball. But he absolutely took him out. You can accuse me of temporary bias if you like and get your comments in and tell me if you think so. But he took Jake Morris out. It was a million miles away from the square. I think Claire would have got back. Got back. I don't think it was a penalty. Flip side, do, what sort of referee do you want here? Do you want people, people like James Owens who are looking to enforce the laws that are put down there and maybe please the referee's assessor in the crowd? Or do you want somebody like Fergal Horgan who let the game flow and let Wexford and Kilkenny knock seven layers, seven layers of dirt out of each other and maybe certain decisions weren't given and maybe other referees would have given Owen Murphy a red card, which I wouldn't have done when it was that penalty decision. I think it was Colin Flood got in and his hurley went flying. What sort of refereeing do we want? What do you want? I want, I want it to be let flow. I would not have given a penalty. I wouldn't have given a penalty either for the Barry Heffernan and Aaron Shanahan. If anything, I would have given a free out. They were both hugging and jostling and kissing and cuddling. And then all of a sudden, it was Shanahan who did the big push. And then at that stage, Heffernan held on to it. But as far as I'm concerned, hurl away, play away. And uh, I'd rather more physicality allowed than, than freeze for everything. I'd be the exact same, Shane. Yeah, I thought Fergal, Hor Fergal Horgan did a massive job on Saturday evening. There's a, an absolutely epic clip going around there, about 70 seconds of just everything that's good about hurling. Pace, power, skill, brilliant defending, brilliant physicality, uh, brilliant hits. And then you look, you just you look at that game defining moment in in, uh, in the Gaelic Crowns yesterday. Like not in a month of Sundays was that a goal scoring opportunity. There were at least three guys in position 
to stop him going for goal, let alone other guys that could have gotten into that position. I will say one thing, Jake Morris, having been dispossessed by Aidan McCarthy just before that, did brilliantly to get a block on Paul Flanagan and get into that position where he won that. So fair play to him. And that was kind of, that kind of underlined a really good performance from him. But to, uh, like, like Shane, uh, as I don't know if you have the image there, but there was an image put on social media last night of how where the foul occurred was actually closer to the actual Ennis Road, the actual road. It was closer to the Ennis Road than it was to the to the Clare goal. It was just a really, really bizarre decision. And um, I don't know what it is about. Uh, I know it was called lunacy in Limerick this morning in our paper. I don't know what it is about Tipperary, the Gaelic grounds, and that particular goal. There's the, the, the image there. Like, it's just, it's bizarre to think how far it actually was away from the goal. Like, yes, by the letter of the, by, not by the letter of the law, you could possibly, you know, find reason how it was a goal scoring chance. But like, that, it's just not realistic at all um, that, that it was, in fairness. And as I said there, the go, when you look back, what is it with Tip and these decisions in the Gaelic crowns? You had the ghost goal into that same goal. Um, clearly in. Three, three years ago, clearly in, yeah. And you had that decision yesterday. And it did just turn the game. Um, because I oh, definitely it, turned the game, it was it, like it a completely two, turned two, four, yeah. two, five. And it's yeah. funny, actually, of, of all the games all weekend, it Tipperary were the only team to really make uh make hay during that sin bin time, and they won the game. There's there's no doubt, and you can say that Claire maybe they didn't manage the situation in the way that Limerick did because Limerick obviously conceded that penalty. Conor Cahalan was taken down, seemed a bit excessive, but in that situation, I was a little bit like he's running right down the throat and he can get a goal shot off here if he isn't wrestled to the floor. But still, Limerick went on to win that period when they had 14 men by four points to two. The penalty was saved. And also for Kenny, Owen Murphy, he pulled down uh, Cone Flood, like I said. Uh, that penalty but Shane, it's one in. thing. Yeah, what you say there, it, 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 there are different scenarios. When, yeah. when a man is sent off and it's a total injustice and you're actually trying to get your head around how this decision is after happening. Okay, number one, it shouldn't have been a penalty and it shouldn't have been a sin bin. Grand. You're after conceding the goal and you're down a man. You don't believe either should have happened. Like, you're not human yeah. unless... It's a you're not, yeah, but you're not human unless that has some effect on you. It's okay, like, Owen Murphy deserved to go and Kilkenny are like, okay, next man up. We get another man in and we try and sort this out. But when a couple of injustices have been done to you, in one go, like you, you could see Brian Lone in the background, you could see uh, Dermot Ryan in the background, you could see John Conlon in the background. It is very hard to get your head around it, and I, I don't know, I, I maybe I'm maybe I'm giving Aver Quilligan the benefit of that as well. He was very, very poor for that for that Callan and goal. They all looked a bit, they all looked a bit kind of shell shocked, and things maybe happened during that period that wouldn't have happened uh, had you know had the penalty not occurred. But the key, the big thing is, is there is no reason in the world why that penalty should have been given. None yeah, whatsoever. I totally agree. Just just to finish out the point, Kilkenny, they, obviously the penalty went in and Darren Brennan, uh, Darren Brennan, I should Sound say. lucky, yeah. Yeah, made a great attempt. A really great. It's, it's, he got the hurley to it and it just seemed like it, it buckled ever so slightly as it made contact. No doubt it was a rocket, but an absolutely brilliant attempt to save it. Without question, it was uh, it was a, a wrong decision. It was a sucker punch, as Brian Lowen called it. But I do think there's a question about how Claire managed the situation. In hurling, anything can happen. Like, you're going to face a blow in a match. You're going to concede two goals in, in the space of a minute, as Cork did it just before half time at Limerick. Fine. They had a period to sort of adjust, then talk about it, settle down. And I thought they came back quite well. Like, if you look at Clare, right, the, the penalty went into the net. Then Tony Kelly dropped one short. Then David Reedy dropped one short. And th that was their fourth and fifth shots dropped short in the game. Tipperary started to tag on a few points. And okay, Clare settled down through Tony Kelly's free. Ian Galvin, who was brilliant for about 45 minutes of this game. Then they hit five wides in a row. Do you know what I mean? There's panicky shots in there. There's shots from 100 yards. There's, you know, Tipperary weren't any world beaters in this monster no. semi-final. And I don't think anyone comes away thinking Limerick will be terrified of that. And, you know, Limerick destroyed Tipperary last year in the Munster Championship. What have we seen to suggest that the gap is going to narrow? I don't think we've seen a whole pile. But we'll, we'll come back to that uh, in a second. But there, there are a lot of comments coming in. And as we always say, keep them coming in, keep them clean at the same time. Uh, dear McKelly, will Owens referee another championship game this year? What did Lohan Sheen, Ashidi do that caused the sin bidding to be so detrimental to Clare? So were there any massive tactics? I just think Tipperary used the ball better. And obviously there was that mistake from Quilligan. He'd made a couple of brilliant saves in the first half. 
one from, um, I think, one from Jake Morris and maybe another one from Seamus Callan. He'd done very well. And Tipperary looked all at sea early in the game. Paddy Maher's playing full back and he slipped early on. And I thought it was just a strange matchup to have him on Ian Gavin, fast, diminutive guy. You probably knew that Clare were going to try and empty space out and play a nice little ball. It was a wet day. Obviously, Paddy Maher slipped for that, as he did for a Mark Rogers chance towards the end. Wasn't it smart, the though, Shane, that, that they put Kelly in full forward to, to make to make Tip make that decision and try and well, put sure, Paddy in an awkward spot? I mean, it was the right thing to do, so it's clever from mm. Brian Lohan, but if you didn't see that coming, is that not a massive surprise? I mean, surely Tipperary saw that coming. Yeah, well, I, I, I would have thought so, too, and it'd just be interesting to see how Limerick, Limerick will go after Paddy Matter in there. Like it's 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 strange nearly to see him in the full back line at this stage of his career, particularly if you know if Limerick are able to create a matchup with, you know, an Aaron Galan or even a Seamus Flanagan in the Munster Finals. So that's going to be really interesting. Yeah. Just like the the question on James Owens, whether he'll referee another championship game this year, uh I don't think Alan Kelly has refereed uh I don't think Alan Kelly has refereed a senior hurling championship game since that twenty nineteen uh All Ireland semi final. So if past history would suggest anything, th there might be a fair chance that he, he won't referee another game this year. Uh, they've been they've kind of come down fairly hard on what were uh, viewed as game defining or season defining decisions. But it'd be interesting to see like do they do the assessors and does Willie Barrett, uh, the chair of the referees committee, like does he think that that was a good call? There's I, I, if if I, I don't know if they'll come back in their man. They they might come back in their man over the, over the next couple of days and come out with comment on it. But it's going to be interesting to see what they do. Yeah, and Lohan, obviously, he was furious afterwards, and he didn't hold back either. And you know what? It's no harm either. Uh, he says that the team, they've trained hard and trained well, came here and gave their all, and I'm so disgusted at that decision, and it's not the first time James Owens has been involved in a decision like that. Last year, David McInerney was sent off, and James Owens was involved in that too. It's just very frustrating. That was against Leash, and it was just before half time. Now, I watched that game, but there wasn't really footage of the incident itself, so very difficult to know what happened there. But Clare were certainly frustrated at the time. It robbed them of having McInerney the next day out. And I wonder, I'm sure Clare will want Shane O'Donnell back in if he's fit enough. So I, I come away from this thinking, lots of credit to Clare, but there's a little bit of self-destruct in there. I think that black card period, it's tough, but like the top teams know how to manage themselves when they're down to 14 men. I mean, we, we keep talking about what the, like, we will talk about what Wexford did against Kilkenny when they had the extra man. We talk about how they maybe came up short as they did in the 2019 All-Ireland semi-final when they should have been in a right good position to beat Tipperary. But Clare started so well here. Uh, first of all, just back to the, the mismatch, I think Paddy Fitzpatrick struggled at times, especially on the ball, and Tipperary just decided to stand 20 yards off him and allow him to carry the ball. One stage in the second half, he just drove away. McInerney may come in for him the next day if he's fit, because Michael Breen did a bit of damage. He was able to turn and go at his man there, and that was a clever move from Liam Cheedy. I mean, Tipperary weren't perfect by any stretch, but he got a good move in that one, uh, Breen got a goal and a point, and also his driving runs upset uh, ups upset them. Like, but Dan McCormick was the one holding things together for Tip in the first fifteen minutes or so. He got a couple of points in that. Clare ended up putting themselves one seven to four ahead, and um, I, I thought, look, Tipperary are in a bad spot here. Yes, there's all that experience, but Clare, Clare fell asleep. They went on a run of being one five to a point. Uh, well, with letting Tipperary go ahead one five to a point, or sorry, score one five to a point against them. And it was only that goal then just before half time. Ian Galvin, very, very clever. Aaron Chandler had been blocked down by Barry Heffernan. Ball scut uh, scuttled loose. Galvin with a lovely flick. I don't think Kyle Barrett, who was in a brilliant matchup with Tony Kelly, could do much about it. When Kelly got the ball, I was just almost, I went for the pen to just write a G beside his name. You kind of knew it. It was but so like instinctive the as well, wasn't it? The finish was just like, oh my God, I'm after, I'm after getting an unbelievable position here. The ball's after ending up my hand. It was like blinking, you miss it. It was in the back of the net. Like. Yeah. And th like, do you think. Do you think towards the latter end of the, of the game, so it was 3.23 to 2.17 um, with, I don't know, including injury time, probably 10 minutes to go. Do you think Tipperary switched off? Because Clare did score the last five points of the game. They had a, a triple goal opportunity at one stage and Tipperary hit six wides. Their last six shots were all wide. Do you think Tipperary tuned out a little bit late on and maybe this probably looks less emphatic than it was for a finish? Yeah, maybe so. Um, I think from a Clare point of view, like... If you look back at that ghost goal in 2018, like that defined Clare season or that defined Waterford season in 2018, and it's so important that like while well, that decision and it was a total injustice to them, that defined that game. They can't let it define their season. And as you said earlier, 
there were so many things good about Clare. And maybe, you know, if David McInerney comes back in, you say Shane O'Donnell, two of their best players, they still have plenty of time to turn it around. And the fact that they finished with a flourish, albeit maybe tip taking the eye off, like, they, you know, they could have limped to a 10 or ten or 11 point defeat when a lot of things were going wrong. So it, I, I, tip probably did take their eye off it, but at least Clare kind of pushed on to the line. So, like, they have lots of it, like, we weren't we weren't didn't have much confidence in Clare coming into the championship and all of a sudden it is like a different prospect and the likes of Ian Galvin and other guys, Ryan Taylor, who was very good at different stages yesterday as well, particularly on. There's a lot more optimism about Clare now. And uh given how low and galvanized them with the amount of things that were going wrong in the background, uh pre-season, mid-season, like I'd imagine he will have them spitting fire. They will think that they've been wronged, and I think that they'll use that to their uh, to their benefit over the next couple of weeks. It's kind of like he's got the spirit of the, you know Newbridge or nowhere that Kildare had a few yeah. years ago. New Newmarket or nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like something like that. We'll we'll steam through some of the comments here because there's lots of good ones coming in and uh, a few play, a few people who are regularly onto us. So it's just, it's obviously going to cover a couple of different games here, but we'll see what people have to say, and we might return to them later. Davy has finished in Wexford now. He's taken us as far as he can, and he hasn't blooded new squad members. And this was there for all to see on Saturday. Three injured subs not able to play extra time, says it all. There were a lot of players that, like, he brought players back on that had already gone off, and you could see them, you know, calving as the extra time went on. And... It was no surprise then that Wexford went on and won as they did. Because, or sorry, Kilkenny won as they did. Because as I was watching players come back on that were clearly not right, and I'm thinking to myself, if you're Harry Kyo, who's been used several times over the years regularly, what are you thinking? If you're Joe O'Connor, what are you thinking? I don't think he came on either. Ah, uh, that's killer, think, Shane. You're definitely questioning your Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd want to walk. I'd want yeah, to walk you're off definitely, the like you There's no point in saying any different. And it's like we talked about during the league, the developing more of a squad. They're developing more of a squad so that like when they need to bring in lads for that five minutes uh, at a different stage late on in the game that they can fit in and that it will be seamless. Like it's a that's a real kick in the stones now for guys that were you know guys that were sitting there that were a hundred percent fresh and fit and ready to go and you're bringing in guys that are hobbling. The same as Cork did in the eighteen extra time against Limerick and that that's why Cork haven't been able to get over the line over in recent years because they just mm. haven't had the squad and it's the same reasons with with Wexford as well. And then you throw it on the other side. I think the Kilkenny bench got one, was it one six or one eight? One eight. One eight. One eight. Um, they're all fresh bodies, particularly like likes of Wally Walsh. Um, and that was, the, that was the big difference, really. Yeah, Wally par- partied like it was 2012, didn't he? Uh, another comment in, what about the number of steps for Conor Whelan's goal for Galway? 12 steps is uh, Shane O'Donnell. Yeah, there was an advantage. There there was an, yeah, there was an advantage in the middle of it as well. But yeah, I actually counted them up last night and it was something that was never commented. And he took about six steps then went into the tackle, was kind of fouled, and then took another six steps after, I'd say. Yeah, so a couple of more comments. Martin Furlong, a lack of a bench is killing Wexford. We have very little coming through at underage, and our two big schools, St. Peter's and Good Council, are not what they once were. He adds, combine that with the poor showing of our under-20 teams in the last few years, and a team is starting to age. There are huge worries coming down the line for Wexford. I actually think they're right in their peak years now, and they probably do need to bring through a couple of more players. Um, but that is a fair point from Martin I'm not Furlong. sure. Not sure if I agree um, about Davy bringing Wexford as far as he can bring them as well. Oh yes, yeah, I mean about players yeah, coming through. But yeah, I, think... but I, I just think it's interesting as well. The, the man that killed Wexford in extra time was Wally Walsh, who went to go council as well. Uh, and you could just see when they play Wexford, it does mean a little bit more for him. Yeah, can you, t- uh, Brendan Hobbs? Can you tell me please why the number of steps you're allowed increases from four to twelve if you're being fouled and allowed advantage? Surely they need to formally change rule as all refs allowed us. Uh, I think you just have to allow a referee referee to interpret. There will be a stage where you have to keep taking steps, and the ref will say, "Look, he's not actually going to get away from his man. We have to blow this." But if you're going to foul your man, you should be allowed to get the advantage. A lot of the time, those sort of drag back fouls happen. Because somebody's breaking the line, they're going to go through to a dangerous position. So I'd just it's, be inclined yeah, to say referee. It's an unwritten rule, Shane, isn't it? It's an yeah. unwritten rule that you nearly almost get another four to five steps if yeah. you've been fouled. And we've just gone too far down the line to try and fully, um, you know, just legislate for what is and isn't a tackle. It's interpretation, and it's very hard to get away from that. And you're going to end up with basketball where someone taps you like that, you know, straight to the free throw line. Will, some of Dublin's players yesterday played to a level I haven't seen in ages. The two Burks, Sutcliffe, Rush was a monster at the back, Crummy, Noli was classed between the sticks, and we'll definitely get to that. Like, Dublin were absolutely sensational. And I've been, and I'm sick of firefighting about why Dublin can't do this, why Dublin can't do that. 
delighted to see Dublin do it. Nothing against Galway, but I'm just delighted for Dublin Hurling because I heard it before. Anytime we went on a run with Kula through the All Ireland series, I kept hearing about how teams were just like, Ash, look, they're from Dublin. You're obviously going to beat them or they won't have the hurling or whatever. So it's good to see that, um, that the Dublin senior hurling team has kind of stuck it up to a few people. Mike Sinnott wasn't Croke Park. Brilliant games, lads. On our team, Wexford had chances. I think we performed well, and there's an argument that Kilkenny are the most consistent team this calendar year. Kilkenny were absolutely brilliant, especially when it went down the stretch, no doubt about it. Fernie has had all weekend to prepare the perfect wrestling analogy for Dublin Go. If he hasn't got one, I'd be very disappointed. Nothing beats Summer Hurling says Patrick Hickey. Um, moving on. I'm not related to James, just for the record, says Alan Jones. Good to know. <laughs> Line of strong job. How Claire did not get a penalty, I will never understand. Uh, it's the rule, not the ref. Or it's the rule, not the ref. The rule has to go, says Patrick Hickey. I kind of Shane, agree. I, I don't really that, like it. Yeah, just back to that again. Uh, I'm, I just said the sin, it was, it's just too severe if a mistake is made in the call for a sin yeah. bin and a penalty. Like, if James Owens had given a penalty there, okay, that's a bad that's a bad call. I don't think it's a game, I don't think necessarily it's a game-defining or season-defining call. I just think the punishment is way too harsh. For what could be a marginal call, that's a game-changer. It's a go- It should be a goal, and it should be 10 minutes with 14 men. It's, to me, it's just too much. Why didn't we try increase the penalty area that a penalty could be given away and just trial that and see how that works. No, we hit the nuclear button on something that didn't need to be pressed and all of a sudden now a mistake and a glaring mistake is made and Claire suffer way too severely as a result. I think a sin bin alone there would have done. I mean, obviously free, so it should be a point. Jason Ford knocks those over in his sleep. But a sin, a sin bin and a penalty was nuts. And, you know, I am a Tipperary man. Now everyone wants to see their own county win. But uh, it was severe. Jesse James, Heffernan played the man and not the ball, obviously referring to the incident with Aaron Shanahan. I have to say, like, that's that's a back's job. You have to try and spoil the man a little bit. And again, if you want to go down to the road to this being a non-contact sport, fine. But there's going to be wrestling. There's going to be dark arts. People championing defenders who are masters of the dark art. And now all of a sudden you want to make this a game of... I think Nate Diaz said it about Conor McGregor about playing a bit of touch, but do you, want, do you actually want this to be <laughs> hurling or not? But there's a line that you cross. You can sort of pull, drag, jostle a little bit within reason, and then Shanahan wrenches it. So that's the point where it becomes a free. As You're off playing touch bud in the park with the guy with the uh, ponytail. Like, come here, <laughs> yeah. I just think that the reason why Shanahan ended up on the ground was I think he initially started the, dra- the dragon and then almost Heffernan, and Heffernan dragged, held dragged, dragged, dragged back and then they both mm. fell to the ground. Uh, if Shannon had caught the ball, I think it would have made an even more compelling case for a penalty to be given. But I think that was a real 50-50 call. And I was, to be honest with you, I was glad to see the benefit of the doubt for once given to the defender. To because, yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> no, but it's just like, how often is a, a forward can start the move and almost instigate the foul and they get the free then themselves? So I think that was a real 50-50 call, but I think uh, I think it could have went either way, but I was probably leaning towards it not being a penalty. Yeah, we're still going through the comments here on Facebook and YouTube, so keep them coming. Twitter as well, we'll keep an eye on. Verney did an interview with James Owens where Owens admitted he misread a penalty decision but overruled it after talking to his umpire. Why did he not do that yesterday on his first championship game? Do, does that ring a bell with you? Uh, don't recall Don't recall doing an interview. Maybe. I, I, I only interviewed James once, um, and that was before he got his first All-Ireland final. So I'm not, I'll, have to go, I'll have to go back and check that, but... There probably for such a big call, there definitely was not enough. Um, there definitely was enough, not enough conversation with people. I think he might be talking about. I did a piece actually on the the nineteen final where James Owens basically deliberated with his linesman for a couple of minutes and got opinions from from everywhere before making a decision. And that was a big decision when he sent off when he sent off uh, Richie Hogan. And James Owens seems to be involved in a good few big decisions uh, with G Shane that have changed games and changed seasons as well. But getting another opinion on that, like. It's a classic one. What did you think of that? And they're like, James, I, I did not see that as a penalty at all. And then all of a sudden, maybe he's like, maybe my judgment is clouded here. So getting a second or third opinion is is not a bad, uh, not a bad move, especially when it's such a big call. Yeah. So like my view of it is, I was kind of almost standing behind where, like, if Jake Morris he had just turned and he was facing directly towards the goal from the sideline, I was more or less directly behind him, and I was thinking. That's filthy. He's got, you know, he's got to go or whatever. That's a terrible tackle. 
but at no stage did I think penalty. And I and I had already written down free, you know, kind of was making my my jotting down my notes. And then someone beside me said it's a penalty, and I was like, it's a bit like with the water breaks. The the whistle is blown, and you're going, oh god, this nonsense. And then you know it was the same with this, and I was like, oh come on, this is over a referee in the game. May, like we often talk about, don't bring football rules into hurling. But for once, I was thinking black card would have sufficed. Uh, Donald uh, Farrell, he should apologise to Claire. If he was correct on tip penalty, he wasn't. Then he has to get the missed Claire penalty correct too. Jack Harnett, let's be honest, Cork are an average team that's resorted to pulling the Limerick Forest jerseys for the whole game, not to mention the rolling around on the ground. On Hegarty, he was simply out of gas. Uh, Mega JW99, seminal moment in the Tip D Clare game. The ref seemed to uh, spooked after he forgot about the water break as head scrambled. Uh, now, uh, Ian Blake says, the problem now is going forward for the championship is another case where the corner forward turns his man, is brought down by the sideline. What does the referee do now? Never a penalty, plus, as you're talking about, Shanahar incident, potential six-point swing. Paul Young, Leinster Hurling Championship was the winner at the weekend. Wexford lost that match, but uh, they had the extra man. But what a game. Kenny never gave up. Donald Farrell, Clare conceded 2-2 during the same game. It was actually 2-4. Missed out on a penalty. TK would have scored. That's 11 points. Game was won by four. Comments are absolutely flying in here. Peter Casey sending off was harsh, but how the hell did Conor Boylan not get a penalty in a sin bin when he that was through later in that game? No, I actually, no, I actually think that he overdid it himself. I think he was looking for contact and he flopped on the ground. There was another incident at the very start of the game. I'm trying to remember who did it. I actually want to double check now just to, to have this right. Yeah, Seamus Flanagan, he went flopping on the ground, grabbed onto Owen Cadigan's arm. And like, as far as I'm concerned, I think it was great when a referee says, do you know what, I'm not falling for that nonsense. And he gave the free. I'm not, so sure. I'm not talking, I don't think I disagree with the, Con I don't think I agree with you on the Conor Boylan one, but honestly, which I do okay, think well, it was a penalty. People get your, your comments in. Uh, the Rebel County, no doubt where he's from. Limerick are pushing their luck with these choke tackles. We'll end up with red cards later in the season. Look, we're obviously going to come to it at some point. I think um, that high tackle from Garode, Hegarty, on Jerry Miller, it could a really good debut game for Cork, I have to say. Came in high. And when I say late, the ball wasn't there. Like, you often say late, one guy gets to the ball first, but they both collide with each other, and it's not free. It might be shoulder to shoulder, whatever. But you came in, you hit a guy in the back of the head. The duty you care is with you. You connected with the wrong part of the person. I think that was a red card. That doesn't mean that Limerick won't go on and win it, but let us know what you think about that. Uh, Adrian McGrath, this is the massive, uh, massive Clare fan. There's nothing wrong with the rule. The rule is designed to force defenders to play the ball. The ludicrous decision was the, the issue. And I don't disagree with that. Jesse James, sucker punch for uh, Claire, that tip momentum for the uh, next 20 minutes. Uh, Kieran Fenley, I think the Owen Murphy sin bin is a perfect example of how the rules should be applied. 1v1, no defender, clear goal on for Wexford. Can't have any complaints. So plenty more comments coming through. Just actually another one from Adrian McGrath. On the Heffernan and Shanahan issue, Heffernan is clearly trying to hold Shanahan off the ball. Both are wrestling, but Heffernan loses his balance. Then he panics and fouls. And how did he lose his balance? They were both 50-50 at it and Shanahan wretched him off to the side. So that would be my thoughts on that. With so many more comments, we'll obviously get back to those in a little bit of time. But are you convinced by Tipperary after this performance? We've already talked about Clare and how we think, yeah, they're an improving side, and I can see a lot of reasons why they'd be feeling optimistic about the rest of the season. Qualifiers are going to be an absolute bear pit now. But Tipperary, what do you make of them, and, and how much have they learned about themselves? I definitely I definitely wouldn't be convinced anyway, Shane. Um, I said it earlier on the year that I didn't think they could start with probably Callan and uh, the two McGraths, Bubbles and Ford in in, a, in the same forward line. They did. I'd be interested to see whether they start. I don't I don't know if they can start with that same team against Limerick. I just don't know if they'll have the energy up front and the legs up front to do a lot of the, the dirty stuff maybe at the other end. They did work the ball really well in the second half. Fairness, uh, like lots of turbulence in the first half, lots of things going wrong. The two matters were under pressure, particularly in that first quarter. Came thundering mm. into it a bit more. Um, the, the use of the ball in the second half was much better even Callan recycling ball out the field for that Alan Flynn score the ball going in was generally going in you know in around that 13 yard area as well when they could they, you know you've talked about it before about balls that have been sprayed out to the sideline and the forwards have been left way too much uh, work Ooh. to do whereas the balls going in were they were close they were you know within the ball stopper area and when you're putting it inside that area there you're giving yourself a chance I do think I do think they'll come on a good bit for that uh, they're obviously it's I know it, we could we can say that they used the three weeks to rest and that was a good thing but they are three weeks without a, a game as well having uh, had a bit of a non-performance against Waterford in their last league game as well they're probably coming into the Limerick game in the perfect kind of scenario are they like they're they're going to be they're going to be 
big enough underdogs going into that game. No, there won't be too many people shouting from the rooftop that you know Tipper Tipper going to beat Tipper Tipper going to beat Limerick. And uh, recent history would suggest that they're not going to beat them. But I think they would have learned a lot from yesterday. I think they'll have learned a lot from that league game where they played Limerick the first day out where they kind of let them have the ball and then press them a bit higher. So I think that's going to be hugely interesting now. Um, and I do say, I think uh, Tip probably got a good bit of dirty petrol out of the system in the first half. Uh, they obviously got a big call, but, you know, it's one thing. It's like it's like in snooker when someone gets, a, you know, a kick or a foul or something like that. You take advantage of it. You show you you show that rootless streak. And in fairness, Tipperary killed the game off during that period when they should have. Yeah, if I if I'm concerned, it's just being reactive, and and I know that you, you like with Burr, with Offley, with Wicklow, and your uh, your your tragic stint there. I think there's <laughs> no, but like you've had definitely had team talks where you're saying beforehand, look, lads, we're going to set the tone here. We're not going to be reactive, and we're going to get scores on the board early. And Tipperary did get the first two here, but Clare completely took over, and it was kind of like a perfect storm. Like the Tipperary backline was under massive pressure. And we talked about how maybe there's too many corner forwards in this Tipperary attack line. And I think that, that kind of came home to roost a little bit early on. The use of the ball wasn't perfect either. Um, but Clare scored everything that they hit in the first 20 minutes. Like, they scored one eight in a row without having a miss. Like, that's absolutely unbelievable. So, it, it, to me, it felt like the sky was falling down on Tipperary. But then there's the experience part of it and the, the calmness and the way that they were able to use that ball and actually... They actually just started getting amongst them because it, it being reactive, not being the team that's kind of setting the tone physically or taking on your man. Actually, and this is a thing now that that bothers me going into the match against Limerick the next day out. They're stuck with the same team. Which look, Liam Sheedy is obviously if if what he's seeing in training is that these are the best lads, then fair enough. There is an argument to be made that do you throw in some other lads that? You know that maybe they're not going as well as in training. Maybe Paddy Cadell isn't playing as well as Noel McGrath or whoever in training. But this is the sort of guy now. Once he gets the experience of one or two championship games, he'll get confidence, belief from the manager, all that kind of stuff. He'll step up to the next level. But when Brendan Maher went down injured in the first half, it was actually Owen Connolly being called in. So I'm I'm just surprised that Paddy Cadell, and I could be wrong on that, but that was what I had heard. I'm surprised that he has fallen down the pecking order, or even Robert Byrne. I know he got a red card, but even Brian McGrath. If Tipperary are going to lose this year, and I said this before, I'd rather it be with the likes of Paddy Cadell, you know, uh, Brian McGrath, and so on in the team, because at least that'll stand to you a little bit further down the line. But Tipperary have gone with some of the older players. They're absolutely brilliant players. I still would definitely start some of them, just maybe not all of them. But how many players on this Tipperary team can turn and beat their man? And against Limerick, you're going to be able to do need to be able to do that. And if you're not able to beat your man, it means that you're probably do you have the pace to keep with the likes of Limerick when Keane Lynch turns at you, when Kyle Hayes turns at turns at you, and Peter Casey and so on? There's obviously I think a you're a liability, there. Shane. I think you're potentially a liability against Limerick if you can't so, if you can't beat your man and you can't track him. So that's why I'm thinking like I don't think Tip will win this game without Paddy Cadell, Alan Flynn. Dan McCormack and Michael Breen being hugely influential because they're the guys that are going to cover massive ground. Yeah. By the way, can we mention Seamus Callan? 37th championship goal. Like He really has been unbelievable since mm. first finding the net back uh, in 2008. Incredible player. And like some people were giving me jip about trying to have him in at number two, number two in the rankings of top hurlers. I'd still have him there. I, I kind of accepted it because so many comments came in to have TJ Reid, who was unbelievable at the weekend as well. Like he was absolutely brilliant in the sense of not necessarily like flowing with scores. He got one one. Obviously, Aver Quilligan made that glaring error for for the goal. He got a nice point, but he set up a lot of scores. Like ball was coming into him. And you want to talk about Barry Heffern and uh, resting with Aaron Shanner? Are you telling me that Connor Cleary didn't throw a saddle up on James Callum's back for this match? <laughs> I mean, come on, like let's be serious about. It. Let's be fair about it. This isn't Tipperary bias on this and get the comments in as well. I thought he had a good performance considering what he was up against. Jake Morris grew into the game. Do you notice him doing the old throw the ball up in the one-handed smack? Yeah, he did it last ball. year as well. Yeah, just yes. a quick one, Shane, as well. Uh, someone had a little short video up. Um, I didn't obviously see the match live yesterday. I just watched it back. Just on Sheedy's management style, it was during one of the water breaks. He was, he was over talking to Bubbles, and it was like a quiet word in his ear. Quiet word in his ear, coaxing him along. And then it was over to, I think it was to Jake Morris, and it was the same thing. Then it was over to Seamus Callan, and he just basically just gave him the fist into the chest like that. 
that's like it's just clear it's just a clear difference between how you deal with different players and obviously Callanan is the leader of that team Sheedy wanted a bit more from him and demanded it from his captain and he and he got it in fairness yeah Donald Farrell says Vernie the game in question was way back it was awfully against Leash that's referring to the James Owen decision yeah I'll have to I'll have to I'll have to check that out can't can't think of that offhand now yeah okay and um, plenty more comments coming in actually i was speaking to derek honan after the game he he was in there watching obviously former claire hurler and all ireland winner and goal scorer in 2013 and he was talking about the massive changeover in this claire team a couple of years ago tip went down to um cusick park and was it 14 points that tip won by you know absolutely pace at this team john conlon was obviously uh, full forward that day and had had a great season the year beforehand, should have been nominated for Hurler of the Year without question, but obviously wasn't put into the shortlist. But I think 10 of the Clare team has changed, which is quite an incredible turnover. Um, I'm sure Connor Cleary, John Conlon, Tony Kelly, not 100% sure, was it David Reedy? Maybe there was, there was obviously a couple more there, but pretty much 10, whereas the vast majority of the Tipperary team remains. And this, this Tipperary team, it is that real problem of growing old together, but there. <laughs> You can't come away from a game where you score 23-23 and act like it was all negative. Just a comment in from Donald Farrell, maybe not six, but where are Peter Duggan, Podge Collins, Jamie Shannon, Shane Mori, and the other Aaron uh, Cunningham, obviously, in the full forward line. I'm all for Lowen, though. He's been wronged left, right, and centre. He probably does feel that, that above him he doesn't have the support that he wants. And then by referees in, in matches like this, that he's, he's not quite getting the decisions. Jesse someone James, had, so, someone had, Shane had a, a brilliant comment up that Lowen should have thrown on the red helmet and headed into the referee's room, <laughs> a hurling hand. <laughs> uh, Jesse James, Jesus, Shane, in a game where a penalty was given 31 yards from the goal, how could uh, a ref not give what you call a 50-50 call for the opposing team? I suppose because he's interpreting rules, calling it as he sees it. I mean, I've tried to explain it, but, you know, I mean, everyone's got a different opinion. Shane, Dennis just a quick Murphy. one on the James Owens thing. I actually found that mm. piece. I rang him when he was announced as a referee for the 2015 All-Ireland Final. And he just talked about uh, the, uh, I just said here, he stressed the importance of working efficiently as part of a team to ensure fair play during every game. And during Sunday week's final, he will be hooked up to eight officials via headset, something he feels he works well. These are direct quotes from James. It happens that I've made mistakes. This year I signaled for a penalty for Offaly against Leash. And I knew almost right away it was the wrong decision. Owen said, I consulted with my umpire who was right beside the incident and threw in the ball instead. That could have been a game changer because the game was in the melting pot. In Crow Park, for a big game, all eight, eight officials can talk to you at any given time. So that helps make sure uh, that the right decisions are made as much as possible. I think that's probably, that's basically what the viewer was or was getting at. That just that a, dis, a change in the decision could easily have been made if he wanted to make it. Yeah. Dennis Murphy, do you think that simulation is creeping into the game? Especially in the Cork Limerick match, there was a few incidents of lads trying to get others yellow carded by rolling around on the ground. I did kind of feel that a little bit at times over the weekend. I don't want to pick out any names, but yeah, I definitely did kind of feel that a little bit. Adrian McGrath, uh, Donald Farrell, Duggan emigrated. Shannon had, had his injury problems. Podge and Cunningham were struggling to get games and walked. Murray pulled out, all right. What's your proof that they're all anti loan I'm not really sure that he's necessarily saying that. Um, Donald Farrell, the two McGraths might be better off coming on when the game is in the balance. Shane, if we sign up for Patreon, will you at least admit Tipperary we're looking for win today? <laughs> He'll do anything for a few quid. Yeah, look, Tip, we're very, very lucky in that game. I'd be the first one to admit. Um, but Noel McGrath being taken off midway through the second half, you know, that that kind of, that really stood out the, to you. Like, did that really stand out to you? I thought, wow, we don't really see this. No, no, that's a, that's a that's a big call. Even though it happened, probably happened a couple of stages in the championship last year, but he wasn't. Yeah, well, he was tired. He wasn't, though, yeah. he, was, he wasn't himself last year. He was and Alan player. Flynn, like Alan Flynn, came on and scored two points. He did himself no harm there. Will there be a temptation to say we'll go with the le like? Obviously, Noel has you know unquestioned class, but is it more a case now we need energy and maybe Willie Connor or sorry, um, maybe Alan Flynn will get the nod. Shane, I, I don't see them beating Limerick without without that energy. Um, I think there's guys that are going to have to sacrifice themselves maybe for 50 to 60 minutes. And then I think potentially uh, an Noel McGrath or an Noel McGrath or John McGrath, someone will come in to try and finish the game for Tipperary. Uh, I just think they're, they're going to need an awful lot of energy. And as I said, I, I just think as good as some of these players are with the athleticism of, you know, if someone's out playing wing forward and Kyle Hayes is bombing forward, like you're, at, you're a liability if you can't keep up with him. Yeah, that is. Uh, so I think we're going to move on from from that match in the Gaelic grounds. Tipperary progressed through to the Munster final. That'll be on July 18th against Limerick. We'll see where the venue will be yet. 
We'll, uh, we'll move on now for, to the, the match between Limerick and Cork. So Limerick finished up 222, Cork 117. And Nicky Quaid, he's done it again to Cork, hasn't he? That was, that was a brilliant yeah. penalty save. But one thing I would say, and you, I mean, far be it for me to question Patrick Horgan, but he did hit the ball where basically the starting position for, for a goalkeeper's hole, like he hit it at the boss side. So like it's that easier extension out. Whereas for Darren Brennan, he was probably going across himself to try and save that one from Mark Fanning. I think it is easier to save it over at that side, isn't it? Yeah, no more than no more than White Quilligan maybe got his hands all messed up for that for that Seamus Canlon goal. At least it was put like it was that that was definitely the flukiest of Seamus Seamus Canlon's thirty seven championship goals. I can tell you that because he was going for a point. There's not in a month of Sundays was he going for a goal from there. But yeah, put if you put the ball back across the goalie, you think you're you're making them make a decision, and you're definitely. You know, you're definitely increasing your chances for him by ten or fifteen percent. I'd say. What do you What do you make of Patrick Collins in the goals for Cork? I think that there's a lot that he does well, and I can see him becoming a really top goalkeeper. But maybe he'll have to go through a few tough times with the puckouts in the mean In the meantime, and also then, there are times when Limerick are just going to win those puckouts against the head. And the amount of times that I put down an, an asterisk beside the scoreline for for Limerick here, and it was like from a Cork puckout. They were just getting turned over time after time. It must be so difficult for a goalkeeper to go in there and try and uh, and try and make an impact. But it's like a high wire act chain almost when you're yeah, in the goals. I, there. It really is. Like I did write down on my notes here, cork implosion on on their own puckouts, and that, that's not just down to Patrick Collins, obviously not. But my God, it was like how many scores did Limerick get out of it? Enough to win the game, anyway. Yeah, and that was definitely uh, that was definitely something that was well flagged in that in that league game. In fairness, they learned an awful lot from that, and and stayed with kind of similar tactics as well. Let Cork have a chart and then press them and try to turn them over, turn them over regular. Then when they did did go along, uh, Limerick were kind of mopping up most of them as well. But yeah, sometimes uh, sometimes you have to go through a few chasing experiences to to kind of learn it. It's such a fine margins in goals. You're trying to find spots, and Limerick are. Limerick are almost tricking you at times as well, tricking you, making it look like there is space at different times. They're almost daring you to put the ball in an area and then get a hurl up or block out that space. Do you know, I, th- I think Limerick's, Limerick's forwards were shut down as well as anyone's shut them down. Sean O'Donoghue on Aaron Gadad was an unbelievable performance here. And the question I came away wondering is, is, is Aaron Galan quite in the top tier of forwards? And I'm talking Seamus Callan and TJ Reid, Joe Canning, you know, Patrick Horgan, the guys who've done it for a decade and more, 13 or 14 years. Is Aaron Galan at that stage just yet? Uh, I don't think he is, Shane, to be honest with you. Like, was, was he, he wasn't in our top 10 and wasn't really in the conversation uh, no. for probably top 15 players. Probably a consistency thing as well. Like, Jeez, I can't remember too many scores he got from play during the league when he did play. He got a couple maybe against Galway when he came in. But he's generally been shut down quite well. If anything, uh, if anything, over the last you know probably 12 months, Seamus Flanagan has probably been the star man in attack and the, the, the guy who's been really, really consistent. Uh, so, like, yeah, no, it, it, if Galan can click, that will offer some Limerick something different. But at this moment in time, like outside of the All-Ireland final last year, he'd a, he'd a quiet enough year last year for Limerick as well. Outside of the All-Ireland final and the tip game when he got that brilliant tip, that brilliant kick goal when he caught it above uh, Rona Maher. But no, he, he's been quiet. Like you count him on hand, the amount of scores from play in his last four or five games. Mm, some of these Cork forwards are really beginning to step up now. Dara Fitzgibbon, he started off midfield, moved to centre forward. He was really good, scored three points. Jack O'Connor continues to step up for the Rebels. He got three. And like, if you're going to be asked to score three points against the best defender in the game, Sean Finn is really going to be in your face and driving it to you. And I thought Jack O'Connor did unbelievably well in that matchup. Shane Kingston scored 1 1. Probably not a perfect performance. But for Cork to come this close, all right, fine. They didn't end up losing by a bit of a margin for a finish. But I think that was somewhat bloated by the fact they were going for goals towards the end. And Limerick scored five points just when Limerick were when Cork were sort of chasing at the end of the game. I, I'd feel somewhat positive if I was Cork, knowing that Patrick Horgan had probably his worst ever game in a red jersey, and they still really pushed what has been a very dominant Limerick team. If you go back to last season, they were tanking most teams throughout the championship. I'd be feeling fairly good. My puck out has imploded. My best player hasn't really had a puck from play, 
and we've still pushed the dominant All Ireland champions this close. And what do people think out there, Michael? What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think you would have taken coming into the game that the one constant and the one guarantee was going to be an eight out of ten from Horgan, and the the question mark would have been over some of the younger, more inexperienced players and what you're going to get from them. And you got the you got the opposite. A lot of the inexperienced players stepped up, and Horgan just had an off day, which which you, you can't really legislate for in fairness. Um, interesting comment from Kieran Kingston after he just said. You can't miss 118 and have 50% conversion when you're playing a team like Limerick. That killed us today. I think you had Cork down as that they missed 19 scoring chances. So if he's saying that you can't miss 118, he's basically saying that you can't miss at all dur during a game. Um, I think the two goals before half time were, yeah. a real, were a real sickener. Uh, Darrow Donovan shot. There's no way really that should have ended up in the net. Um, I think it was, uh, it was a deflection into the net, but... Patrick Collins was probably standing maybe too much to that side as well and the deflection kind of you know fell into an open net Hayes's goal was really interesting because you know the way we've talked about uh, even when David Fitz was with Clare how Conor Cleary would end up under a puck out or even I kind yeah. of flagged it up maybe that, that Damien Cahalan or Tim O'Mahony could end up under a puck out but Hayes ends up under a puck out but not directly under it they, they put it under the half forward and he's gone past the half forward almost uh, anticipating a break and Robbie O'Flynn didn't track him back just kind of maybe switched off for that couple of seconds and in fairness to, to Galan and we said he hasn't maybe done that on the scoreboard in recent games that was a lovely little flicked ball inside for Hayes Hayes turned back inside you're not expecting Hayes to probably turn back to his right as well um, you're expecting him to want to go off that left and that was a lovely finish while while O'Donovan's probably should have been stopped definitely should have been stopped I would have said Hayes is going to be so difficult to stop when you hit the ball into the ground from that sort of area into the corner as well and that was a real game changer Just you're looking at that and you're thinking how are they six up going into half time mm. and that did really change uh, that did really change the complexion there was a stage in the second half where Owen Cadigan probably not the player you wanted to have taken a shot had a shot I think it was to put three in it uh, it was either three or two it would have yeah, no, yeah. put three yeah. and that was just a big kind of game changer as well uh, they were just kind of chipping away then then I think Limerick went up and got the next score uh, did, yeah. as, did, as they do but uh, there, was just, there, was, there was plenty of signs of light for Cork but the thing maybe that we talked about before and maybe just not being convinced that they're quite there just yet, I don't still don't think they're there. I still think they could take a scalp, but I think next year there'll be a serious proposition. But there's plenty of green shoots for them anyway, without a doubt. Yeah, when I did my report of this game um, on Saturday evening, a lot of people from Limerick were felt that I was just kind of critical of Limerick or that uh, I didn't give them enough credit. But I think it's the esteem that I hold them in that I sort of point to a lot of flaws in this performance and you know obviously I've mentioned those things about Cork Limerick missed 23 scoring chances in this game they actually missed more than Limerick and you know we can point to Cork letting letting Galway off the hook when they did but like even you know after that situation when you know we said that Owen Cadigan missed and that was actually a fourth wide in a row from Cork they were all doing it in too many from distance from the likes of um, Patrick Horgan and his his long range freeze Michael Verney will be back there in a second <laughs> Limerick steadied down then got that score from uh, Dermot Burns, but then they hit four wides in a row. Now, ultimately, they, they got a few more scores and won the game towards the end, but it was not It was certainly a flawed performance from them at the same time. But I think that burst before halftime, which Michael Verney has already explained, that was absolutely decisive in this game because from Cork, they were going for these low percentage chances, and I was just looking at them. There was uh, Patrick Horgan, again, had a free from his own half. This was... I think probably around his own 45, the free had been won by uh, Sean O'Donoghue, who, as I said, was absolutely brilliant. He knocks that wide. Uh, the Darrow Donovan goal comes a minute later. Obviously, you can't blame uh, Patrick Horgan from that. But it, there was a ruck ball, and losing a 50-50 ruck ball when you should have greater numbers than the opposition, not too far from your own 21, I think that's a really bad sign for, uh, for Cork. And then just a, a minute later, then I'm just going. I'm just running through the the before half time there, Michael. Now that you're back, mm. but then, like after that long range free from Horgan, then there was the the Darrow Donovan goal to sort of punish that. Then Tim O'Mahony took a sideline from distance in the 38 minute. That didn't go over another low percentage chance. And then obviously there's that goal for Kyle mm. Hayes as well. It was like a team that played the percentages a little bit more won their ruck ball. I mean every team measures their, their contested possessions. And then that brilliant ball from Aaron Galan, which allowed Hayes to come through. And he made sure of it. He didn't just shoot from a ridiculous angle. He cut inside and used his bit of power. It's funny and you say that, Shane, because Cork generally had been going for the percentage chances throughout the league. They'd always been given the extra pass 
to either force the goal or make the point an absolute no-brainer. So just some of the decisions. Listen, uh, to me, to me, it's great. That that's what people back in the stadium does to you. That's what pressure does to you. Um, that's what championship does to you as well. Yeah. And that's what, like, just look at the, the even the scores that were put up over the weekend. Different type of scores completely compared to the league. And I know we're going to talk about Dublin and Galway. Like that was a real old school kind of a scoreline as well. And some of the scorelines over the weekend were like that. Probably Wexford and uh, probably Wexford, Kilkenny, and, and Tip Clare were probably two outliers in in that kind of regard. But people br- coming back definitely increased the pressure. And I, I've always said I like mistakes. I think it makes players look fallible. I think it makes a game nearly more interesting when people are making mistakes and maybe taking the wrong options from time to time too. Yeah, I must say, when a couple of times, Tim O'Mahony, 34 minutes, got an unbelievable point. The way Cork worked that puck out, out and just started throwing it around for each other, like there was stick passing, there was hand passing, there was running off the shoulder. I even note down here that that was total hurling. Like, I think when they, when it comes off for Cork, they're absolutely incredible. And I think they can kick on. And I think, they, like you said, I think they can take another scalp this year. But that was a that was a big learning game for them there. Every time they play Limerick, who did a pretty good record on in the last couple of years, they're going to learn something more about themselves. And some of these players will get more exposure to this level. And we mentioned the likes of Jerry Millerick. I was talking to Fintan O'Toole of the 42, who was down at the game. I was obviously at Crow Park. And uh, he was saying that the kind of setup was like, they tried to keep Coleman free when they could, and Millerick would drop on to Keen Lynch, who was centre forward. Conor Cahalan and Kingston came deeper around the middle. Horgan and Jack O'Connor were the two inside. And then, obviously, like when Mead came in, Fitzgibbon, he went to 11 and, and did very, very well. But like Jack O'Connor, Shane Barrett, Jerem Millerick, you know, I'm obviously forgetting one or two as well. They were really, really good. So lots of, lots of big positives for Cork just before we finish this out. But like for Limerick to come up against a team that has a huge amount of positives, still win by eight points yeah. and feel like we have a lot we can improve on. And, but like a word of caution about Limerick as well. Some of the tackling is a little bit too tasty. Four yellows in the first half. Five, I think, Gro- in the first half, yeah, actually. Gro- yeah. Gro- Hegarty. Look, I think he should have seen the line for that. People might think, oh, what have you got against Hegarty? Or, you know, you've got in for Limerick now that they're winning. No. I mean, just look at the incidents. It's, it's simply down to that. And if you want to show us other incidents, we can talk about that too. Just another thing to bring up. I thought this was interesting that the top three possessions in play. Now this was in the forty second by the forty second minute. Sean O'Donoghue had the most possessions for Cork after forty minutes with ten. Jerry Millerick had ten. Damien Cahillan with nine. So that just tells you how Limerick were forcing Cork to play because the other side of it, Lynch was on the ball most times. Hegarty next. Kyle Hayes. So probably the three guys that you're thinking are the biggest ball players. Whereas whatever it is about Limerick. They're very good at forcing you to use your players. Like, if you're Cork, who do you want those three players to be? You probably want it to be Dara Fitzgibbon, Mark Coleman, Patrick, Patrick Horgan, Horgan. Yeah. you know, for something like that. So trying to get the ball into the hands of your best player. And maybe this explains why Patrick Horgan didn't have his greatest game. You know, Declan Hannon was able to sit back, probably, and sweep nicely, and good ball wasn't going in on the front foot. So Limerick are doing an awful lot right in ways that... Yeah. You know the way there's like, uh, what's that famous uh, quote by Donald Rumsfeld? There are known knowns, unknown knowns, and unknown unknowns. Stuff like that. Car- uh, Limerick are probably ticking so many boxes and we don't even know those boxes. Yeah, exist. It's, pl- it's playing the game on their terms, isn't it? It's what's going to make them uncomfortable. What's the, like, who do we... It's, it's basically asking the question, Shane, even before the game. Who, what car players do we want on the ball? And what Cork players do we not want on the ball? Okay, it's maybe picking out a couple of guys and saying, okay, they can afford to have the ball back here, but we're going to let them have the ball back here, but we're not going to let Horgan et al. have the ball up front. And uh, it's basically playing their game in their terms. And then on the, the flip of that is, who do we want on the ball? Hayes, Hegarty, and Lynch. And we get them on the ball. Yeah, and there's like John Kiley was in um, the Gaelic grounds, obviously watching that semi-final between Cork or Clare and Tipperary. How would he get a ticket? Don't know. Don't know. Maybe someone looked <laughs> after him. I haven't a clue. I'd say, though, I'd say there was no way he was going to be refused entry from the Gaelic Crown. Him and Paul can take were at the game together. Yeah. So, any final thoughts then on Limerick and how good they are heading into that Munster final? Looking no, for three in a row. Hasn't yeah. been done since 89 when uh, when Tipperary and the boys did it back. <laughs> <Bye. laughs> uh, it's obviously for the for the McMackey Cup this year. It was the first year it was kind of renamed, so uh, that obviously is extra special for them. But I think what like what you're saying there, if Limerick people are getting up in arms, it's just like you're almost you're almost complimenting them. 
you're looking at different things that maybe went wrong for them and you're still saying they won by eight points. Not having, you're not having a go. You're all, if anything, it's, it's flattery, I would say, more than anything else. But they have lots of room for improvement, uh, which is a frightening thing, I would say, for Tip going into that, that Munster final, knowing that Limerick beat Cork by eight points. Don't think many other teams could beat Cork by eight points while probably only been in third slash fourth gear at stages. Yeah, analysis and coaching. What did you think of the 30-plus brigade in all the games last weekend? I thought Joe Canning had a very, like, probably the quietest game he's had, and he missed 10 scoring chances, so he won't be happy. Thought TJ Reid was brilliant. Thought James Callan did pretty well. Patrick Corgan, obviously, very quiet. Yeah, I mean, if, if anyone has any thoughts on any other of the more experienced players, let us know. Quick uh, one for Matt. you, Shane, actually. Yeah. Uh, in, the, the, in the Euros last week, the average age of the Italian defence is 34 years and I think 236 days. So I, I know I, I, that's nearly my age right on the button. So, uh, so I, I know you're a small bit north of that, but there's still hope for us yet. There is, of course, aging hipsters. And a third of the captains in the Euros were 35 or older. Uh, Martin Ahern, Limerick are a physical team. If you can't stand up to them, don't be complaining about them. If any other team in the country had those players, they would be playing a different game. I don't think so. Yeah, I, I actually agree, fair. Shane. It's the same as the Kilkenny team of the noughties. A lot did a big physical team generally. The likes of Derek Ling, like real enforcers, uh, Martin Comerford as well. So to me, use what you have. I think Limerick will be playing a lot differently and defending a lot differently if you know every player was six foot. So you got to use what you have. What we we have said it before though as well. There, when there are physical mismatches uh, with a six foot four powerhouse tackling, you know, a five foot nine dynamo that is going to lend itself to potentially robust challenges and maybe things looking worse than they are as well. And maybe teams trying to use that to their advantage as well, opposition teams. Yeah, but you can't blame the lad five foot nine having his head this high. If you're no. six foot four and your head, Hurley is up there, the duty cares with you. And also another thing we talked about earlier in the year, what's the point in Cork losing the same all the way? They're trying to work the ball out. They didn't go short with every ball. Seamus Harley going off was a massive one. Remember, he won a couple of brilliant puck outs just before half time. So they lost him. But Brian White says, as a Cork fan, I'd have brought off Horgan. He was missing freeze and having no impact from play. Declan Dalton is a brilliant free taker and has more physical presence up front. I'm not sure. I think Declan Dalton has great wrists and all that. But sometimes, much like a lot of great forwards, the ball might have to be put into his hand a nice bit for him to do the damage. I'm not but sure about taking off your... I still don't know. I, I don't know if you can take off someone that can do Limerick some magic do that. at the end. Tim, Limerick took off Hegarty. They took off Galan. It didn't, bo it didn't bother them at all. They just said, we're going to trust the panel in a way that, you know, maybe Davy Fitz didn't this past week. Yeah, it's, it's trusting a panel that they do trust, though. They're, they're, there's, a, there's probably the answer in itself. Do Cork really trust what they were bringing on for Horgan? Limerick do trust that when they bring in Pat Ryan or when they bring in, I know Adrian Green didn't come in at the weekend, when they bring in Graham Mulcahy, who was very lively when he came in and could well start the next day now again. They, there's, it's, there's more trust, I think, you know? Yeah, Mossy Lines isn't holding back. Cork forwards have a serious sense of entitlement. They won't lift a finger if the ball delivered in isn't 60 40 in their favour. They won't work off the ball either, turning over and pressurising. Think that's a bit harsh? Um, I know Ben O'Connor would have said the same last year. I don't know if I'd quite say the same this year, uh, but they definitely, uh, they definitely do want the sympathetic ball. The chances of them winning the 50-50 ball is an off. But that's the, that's the way they play, Shane, and that's their, that's their size profile as well. It is going to be more difficult for them. I don't think they throw in the towel or anything like that, though. Maybe last year I would have said it stages they did, but I don't think not as much this year. Mm, yeah, uh, Mega JW ninety nine Limerick full backline is the new steel curtain. Sean Finn can rival Mean Joe Green in my book. Raymond Gilburn says Keen Lynch was hit off the ball just before full time. Uh, John Hoare Limerick are really like the Springboks are hurling strangle teams of physicality, not pretty but very effective. Um, let's see now another comment in. Donald Farrell, Groat Hegarty should have got the line again. He will have every ref in his back this year, but so should Robbie O'Flynn for pulling Sean Flynn's helmet. What did you make of that? I think like there are situations where it's intentional pull of the helmet, and he's. I think he just had his hand out and the helmet. You know, I mean, it's a free, no doubt about it. But a red card, I, I wouldn't think so. I don't think it's the difference between intent. yeah, there's a difference between like grabbing and just having your hand there, and all of a sudden like. It's almost not a clothesline, but you can end up hitting off the helmet and it can come off. But uh, yeah, Hegarty definitely has his card marked. He has card marked well coming into this year anyway. And even the kind of the, the hit on Joe Canning's back last year, um, and even just how he, do, he does foul quite a lot. 
He's very, very, very robust and he's quite loose with the hurl. So his card is definitely marked. And, you know, if he were to be sent off or something that, particularly in early stages of a game, some stage this year, that definitely put the cat amongst the pigeons for them, you know. Mm. I just a reminder, we're brought to you by ogreretro.com. If you want to get that Mayo jersey that Michael Verney has or a Limerick jersey, Cork jersey, you name it, go on to ogreretro.com and use the promo code our game and you get 15% off. There was one on, uh, there was an ogreretro jersey on, I think it was Claire Byrne Live during the week. Uh, one of the guests or people that was in Skype studio was actually wearing the Wexford 96 jersey. So a great advertisement. You won't get much better advertisement. Apart from us, that's the, that's the oh. next best. And also, if you want to get this on audio podcast, the only place to do it is on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash our game and join the supporters club for a fiver a month to support the channel as we sort of try to build on for the future. We'll, um, we'll look at the fantastic win that Dublin had over Galway at the weekend. 118 to 14. It was like a scoreline from the 90s, wasn't it? Sensational stuff. Courage under fire, I would have thought, too, here, because this was a tough day for James Madden, the wing back from Ballyboden St. Enders. Uh, his dad hasn't been well and passed away during the week. And you know, the funeral was on Friday. Really tough, no doubt. But um, Matty Kenny spoke afterwards. And, and, Mar- and Matty Kenny's brother-in-law, Michael Flanagan, um, he also passed away recently. So there was a minute silence beforehand. And, I, and like I was just thinking, during the minute silence, like obviously both men <laughs> come away with great credit. Dublin get the win. Madden plays well. Matty obviously oversees another victory over his native county. But just during that minute silence... And, you know, the focus has been put squarely on, on, on the sad situations. Like, it must be a tough, very, very tough minute for those, those two men there. And then for Madden to be able to react and just leave his heart out on the pitch. You know, you can't but admire that. Yeah, no, Shane, just even as you're talking there, it kind of goose pimples uh, just because it's such, a, it's such an emotional thing because I, I can't imagine the, the, the courage that's needed for James Madden and the courage that's needed... Uh, with inside Matty as well to be able to continue to do their jobs while you know dealing with all sorts of crazy emotions going on in your head as you said and it just yeah you, you would you just love you'd love to nearly be inside their head during that minute side so thinking what they're thinking then to be able to have that raw emotion going through your head and then just to be able to focus when when you know when the game kicked off you know fair play to the two of them and that was I don't know. I don't know if if that if any of that galvanised Dublin, but like they delivered an absolute barnstorm and display from start from start to finish. And um, one of the things that impressed me most at the end was just the lack of panic and just how cool they were on the ball, how they worked out ball, how there was no aimless ball down on top of the goal with Freeman. They stuck with what they were doing the whole way through. And I'm just thinking then, and I said it to you off air, like does Matty Kenny have have Galway's number now? That's two big championship wins we talked about you know uh maybe like the likes of Niall Corcoran uh having an insight into the Dublin camp as Wexford coach having an insight into the leash camp but like the inside man Matty Kenny who would have worked with a lot of these guys in 2012 under under Anthony Cunningham and maybe obviously was probably uh Manny would have thought he would have been Galway manager by now and maybe this will uh these sort of results will help make sure that he is Galway manager yet but he obviously knows Galway inside out and has studied him forensically. He knows his own squad, squad inside out as well. And just, they were just brilliant. You just it, it would have been very hard to predict this. And just the dominance of it, uh, really, like they, you know, they never they never trailed, did they? Really, after, no, after, no, no, after, after from, the early stages, from post to post. you know, like it's it was a phenomenal result from from one to fifteen. Yeah, it really was. Galway were that's as poor as I've ever seen them. And to put up a to post a scoreline of just one fourteen is it's pretty shocking, really. I mean, from like fifteen scores converted from forty one attempts, uh, ten missed chances from Joe Canning. A lot of the four Brian Concannon, I can't remember him ever feeling the way to the ball. Keno Callahan was was all over him. Joseph Cooney posted in at full forward at the start of the game. Obviously, they thought. You know what? We'll give Owen O'Donnell something different and create maybe a mismatch somewhere else by not putting Connor Whelan directly in there on him at the start, and instead we'll put Joseph Cooney in there. And Joseph ah, that's Cooney. overthinking, Shane. That's I, I yeah. Think that's Joseph really Cooney will snap the ball over Owen O'Donnell. Yeah. Owen O'Donnell is the best fullback in the game now, especially now that Dahi Burke has been moved out of fullback and he's playing centre back and did barely poke the ball in this game comparatively. Like he he was fine, but like he didn't dominate the game in any way, shape, or form. Like Owen O'Donnell is now the best fullback in the game, as far as I'm concerned. I'd love to hear who's better. But 
he's probably going to miss the Leinster final now and the mouth-watering matchup that he would have with TJ Reid. This year, they'd have to go with that matchup. It was a disaster not, last year not going that way. But Owen O'Donnell, best fullback in the country? I think I, I think his performances in a team in the last couple of years who haven't exactly been lighting it up. He's been he's always been good, and I suppose the common denominator, uh, if you're looking at it, like when they were beaten by Leash, he wasn't playing that day as well. He just he just brings he just kind of has it all really. He has the power, he's the pace, he's he's a miserable defender in the best way possible. I mean, like he just won't give you he just won't give you a puck at, won't give you a sniff at. Brilliant to get in a flick in. Brilliant on the ball, can take a score as we saw against Antrim. So, yeah, to be honest with you, I, I, I'd be hard pressed to probably look outside him at the moment, and his loss will be huge in the Leinster final. But just a, like just a quick one on, on Galway, Shane. Like th- this is a throwback to like Galway of like six or seven years ago. Like real inconsistent. It's like <laughs> I put it this way: like they, they were like Arsenal, Arsenal in soccer. You couldn't back Galway to win a match when they were favourites because you just weren't sure what they were going to get off them you couldn't back somebody when they were playing against Galway when Galway were underdogs because again they were liable to do anything and this is the first performance in a long long time like that and that's really worrying now I have to say from their perspective and they've got big questions to answer heading into the qualifiers they're you know they're potentially if they want to get to an All-Ireland final they could be looking at playing five of the six weeks remaining and you're also looking at their age profile and you're thinking like time is probably running out for you know Joe Canning, uh, David Burke in particular, those guys, the pillars of the you know 2017 All Ireland winning team. So like, Jesus, like it's going to be difficult to turn it around. They have the quality to turn it around, but it's not going to be simple. We're we're Galway arrogant here, trying little flicks and tricks, going for goals from the very start. I mean, I couldn't understand Joe Canning going from a goal outside the the 21 to start a game. Alan Nolan saved that and had a, a brilliant game. Must be said, he was he was exceptional, but. What were Galway up to? Just trying to force goals. Was it like they were thinking, sure, look, we'll eventually beat Dublin anyway, so we'll just start going for goals and bury them early? Yeah, it was very strange, Shane. Again, was it like, arrogant? More, yeah, man, maybe, maybe so. As I said with the Joe Cooney thing, that's try, it's, it's, it's trying to be too smart. And I think they were trying to be too smart and be too cute on the ball as well. And, you know, on, on the Canning situation, like, you'd have to really wonder, did the, did the, you know, the championship record, the championship scoring record weigh heavily on his mind? He did, just he was... in, did he have a wrist injury at the end of the league? I mean, just to, to sort of be fair to him in some in some sense. Maybe, maybe so, maybe so. But like the, going for that, going for the goal from that twenty one was was peculiar to say the least. Some of his some of his wides were just so uncharacteristic as well. That's just, just not it's not the Joe Canning that we know. Um, he did have a, he did have, he had a rib injury, I think, and he had a, a wrist injury or a thumb injury as well. So you ha- would have to probably give him the benefit of the doubt. But there was a lot of things happening in that game. Like wides from Cotton Mannion that, that you just wouldn't expect. And said so Brian Cannon, who was in the form of his life three or four weeks ago, just very, very literally set up Joe Canning for a goal. And then the, I think the block, it was blocked down. He came in and pulled on and pulled it wide. Apart from that, had little or no influence in the game. Maybe we were going to, maybe we were focusing on Galway too much from a Dublin, from a Dublin point of view. There's so many lads really came of age. Uh, like we've talked about Dara Gray throughout the league and even in the last couple of years, he was just brilliant and getting forward to have he's the he's a real kind of modern day defender in that he can defend really well, he's really strong under a high ball and you know, we'll go man to man with a, with it, with his opponent, but is also able to come for, come forward, hurt him on the scoreboard. I wonder, like, being honest, did you think Liam Rush was capable maybe of what he delivered the other day at, at this stage of the day? I'm not sure if I if I if I thought it was in him at this stage of the day with the injuries he's had in recent years, and I just thought he was so clever in some of the things that he did the other day. I think sometimes in the performances that we've seen this year, you think, yeah, okay, he's coming back to his best now, and then you see him the last day against Antrim. I don't know, he was probably sweeping to some degree, and Neil McManus was able to step off him and get a few scores. But I did think, well, maybe this is coming towards the end of the road for Liam Rush. But I, there, there was probably an element of a gamble where Matty is like. I'm not sure do I trust anyone else to play centre-back just at the moment based on their form. I'm going to gamble Rush. Uh, or maybe he saw enough to say, look, this he will come good. But he was really, really good here. He was really good. And so many of the, the Dublin players were. Danny Sutcliffe was brilliant, really stepped up in the second half, especially three points in that second half. I think if, if Dublin go on to win the Leinster final, if he, he will be key to it and he'll more, like, more than likely be winning an all-star for it. I actually think there's more in Donald Burke. He got two points from play here. I think there's far more in him. Chris Crummy, I thought, brilliant for the goal. 
relatively quiet and even inside line i think for keen boland had to go off uh, injured early on and let's have a quick little look at uh, what came up at the screen at the time yeah there was a couple of flags here i think we were still throwing back to the euros we had an english flag for mark Schute and a belgian one for keen boland uh, that came up in error but if anything it should be a german flag with a surname exactly. like Schute, as exactly, i often yeah. remind yeah. <laughs> but well, like no, i no. think there's more i think there's more in that dublin forward line like keen boland as i said went off with a concussion Ronan Hayes got two in the second half. Keno Sullivan got just a point. I think there's actually a lot more in this Dublin team. And like some people out there, they're probably quick to dismiss Dublin. And for that reason, that's why I'm delighted that they ran it down people's throats. But like, look at how they can chose. be dismissing them now. I don't, you no. cannot be dismissing them now after that. That's like they've taken down the number two team in the country on farm coming into the championship. Yeah. Now, they did write their luck early on, no doubt about that. But anytime you're going to have a surprise win, you're going to have to write your luck to some point. But like, Go through the spine of this Galway team. I thought Shane Cooney was quite good. I thought Darren Morrissey was quite good. But I thought the half back line, the much vaunted, you know, and we've been the ones vaunting them, of Parik Manning, uh, Dahi Burke, and Finton Burke didn't stand out. I think Sean Loftus barely pucked the ball in the first half before he was taken off. Cahill Mannion, he was key to that bit of a mini revival at the start of the second half. A couple of solo runs ended up, but I think an assist and led to someone else winning the free, but it was all down to his uh, solos. Then he did that beautiful reverse pass for Conor Whelan to go through and score the goal after 55 steps. I know, like, he was being fouled, so obviously you get to play on there. But, like, this is, I'm talking spine of the team here. Obviously, Joe Canning didn't get into the game. Adrian Tui, he picked the 12, didn't get into the game. Joseph Cooney in full forward, didn't work. Conor Cooney got a point, didn't work. Brian King Cannon, it didn't happen for him. Conor Whelan scored one too, but still out of the game at times. I mean, you come away from it wondering... Geez, what can Galway take from this game? What can they salvage and say, well, look, we, we'll come back through the qualifiers? Like I've talked about, yeah, Claire did this right. They still got maybe Shane O'Donnell, Aaron Fitzgerald, and um, one other player come, to come back, David McInerney maybe to come back into the team. Cork did a lot well, imploded on certain things, but you can see how they make that better. Galway, just the fact that they have class in the team, yeah, you can see how they can, they can match anyone. But in terms of getting back to taking a step on from last year, Wow, you just hope that this would, from their point of view, would serve to be a rocket up the team to get them going again. And they didn't just labour and win and then get beaten another day, that this would just be a rocket for them. Maybe that's what they can take from them. Yeah, it's funny. Like, I, I'd be working in a horse race in a good bit. And when a horse runs really, really badly, the trainer and the jockey will just say, OK, we put a line through that performance. And the horse obviously doesn't know that he's ran badly. So he can just come out the next day and potentially win the next day. You, you'd think in your head, you think, God, we need to put a line through that. But it was so bad at too bad to be true and then you're trying to turn things around in you know what two weeks time and they've got such a busy schedule ahead you'd be hoping um from Shane O'Neill's point of view that the likes of Canning the likes of David Burke Dahi Burke the leaders of the team will stand up and just drive things on from here but um yeah dif difficult difficult for them it's gonna be difficult enough to turn around turn around and it's gonna shark tank waiting for them in the qualifiers as well Brian McNamara is after commenting that Ajay's lads, Galan is class, got the goal against Tip last year, class in the All-Ireland, he, he is class. Lyric have come a long way when Trim and Cork by eight points is seen as a disappointment, but that is the esteem we hold them in. Brian White, you're dead right, Shane. I don't think Dublin played their best, but still has loads to spare there. Any final thoughts on Dublin before we move on? No, just that, like, look at three or four weeks after the league. Dublin, are, after winning uh, Leinster under-20 uh, championship, they're in an All-Ireland final against, Gal against Cork this week. They're in a Leinster final, uh, All-Ireland quarter-final at worst. Um, it's amazing, you know, you say like a week is a long time in politics. A couple of weeks is an awful long time in Ireland as well. There's mm. so much optimism in Dublin now. Yeah, absolutely. And brilliantly taken goal from Chris Crummy, I might add, midway through the second half. Sorry, Shane, Ana well. well. Murphy leaving the line. I can't handle this. I cannot handle keepers leaving the line and leaving an empty goal. There's five guys back there, but a goal of players in the picture with just Crummy and one Dublin player outside him. When the keeper leaves, that I just I, I cannot handle it. It just it, it's just, you're leaving an empty goal for them to strike the ball into. It just does not make sense to me at all. Why do you think he did it? it it's a rush of blood to the head, and it's trying to cut things off. Re, uh, it's trying to you know I think it's an overreaction, and it's a bit of a panic as well. And it's it maybe partly due to how bad that they were going in the game. And you're almost trying to make something happen here, trying to deny a chance. But, jeez, there was enough bodies there to look after it. Without, like, I'll put it to you this way. Like, I don't if, if if Murphy hadn't left the line, that's not a goal. You Do you know, think so? Not, it, no, like, Crummy will take a shot. Yeah, but it's still fancy the keeper to save it, though. 
Do you know well, what I mean? He probably doesn't. He pr- he probably need to wind up to bury a shot from where he was. But yeah. He only needs to tap it once the goalie is there. Just get it past him. Yeah. And you know that that made the scoreline one thirteen to one nine, given that small little bit of daylight. And you know what? When do- when Murphy had made a brilliant save from Ronan Hayes just beforehand to give him his dues at the same time, I thought maybe Dublin are now going to leave this behind them. But they didn't. Uh, Brian White's after adding in that uh, Ian Murphy isn't a good goalkeeper, makes too many mistakes and rash decisions. It is tough. Maybe he'll learn from that and people get your comments in if you if you believe that he might do so. We'll move on now to Kilkenny's game against Wexford and what a classic it was. 2.37 to Kilkenny, Wexford 2.29 after extra time. It was all about that bench for, for Kilkenny. They scored 1-8. Now, Wexford did get a boost from their bench in normal time. Jack O'Connor scored a point. David Dunn scored a goal. But outside of that, they did really fall away. And it tells, it's, it tells us plenty of things. It tells us that Kilkenny probably trusts the depth of their panel more. And like when I was looking at the likes of Paddy Deegan and he was still sprinting around like a newborn lamb going into extra time, I was thinking the fitness level of these Kilkenny lads, and no doubt Wexford lads are fit, but the fitness and their, the fact that you can't find any bottom to these lads, that, that is unbelievable and credit must go in because we did question Kilkenny a nice bit coming into this, but credit where it's due. Yeah, um, to be fair, Shane, we probably questioned their athleticism in recent years compared to some of the other big teams as well. I know it definitely would have been questioned when they faded out against Waterford in the second half last year. There was no fade out there on Saturday evening at all. Um, it was just it was outstanding the way they finished. Turned that game around, having been down uh, to 14 men and obviously bringing in Darren Brennan. I was, I was, were you half surprised in a way that, that Murphy came back in? I was, I was wondering, would they leave... Would they leave Darren Brennan in goals almost? Um, that that would have been interesting. It would have been interesting actually. This is I'm only just thinking this on the spot. If Darren Brennan had been brought on the goals and it, all of a sudden they say we're going to leave Darren Brennan in goals and all oh, Murphy's going to play our field for the last ten minutes, that's probably <laughs> that's probably me talking a bit of rubbish. But um, just I just thought um, yeah. Can, but they'd be glad they did bring him back in because Owen Murphy made an absolutely crucial save ah, from uh, Rory O'Connor and the score that would have made the score one thirty four to three twenty nine. So it would have nudged West for back in front with like six minutes to go and maybe that would have given them the burst of energy because they were reeling before that Kilkenny had hit three in a row and you know Wexford were circling the drain Speaking of Murphy I'd say he was Hawkeye really saved them for that one fairness to Conor McDonald it would have been one of the great goals it's one of the great goals that never was like Murphy flicked it down the ball was obviously a judge that gone over the bar I think those ones are really, really ropey. Like the the ball, the more than the Brian Hogan ones in 2019 against Wexford, obviously the same. It's just amazing how Wexford have been the ones that. Well, they drive it over properly in less than nothing. <laughs> but the ball shows like that it's gone like uh, you know five or six yards over the bar. It's definitely not. It's so so marginal if it is gone over the bar. So so marginal if it is. I know Andrew was saying there it would have been a square ball if the point not awarded. I don't know if it would have been called as a square ball because there were so many things going on at the time. But uh, in fairness to Murphy, he definitely uh, redeemed himself. You know, uh, Davey had some interesting comments from Walter Walsh got the goal. He said, uh, I could see James McGarry reaction when they got the second goal. He nearly jumped out of the stand and came down to tell me about it. So it must have meant a lot to him, which is great, uh, tongue in cheek. I'm glad to see his enthusiasm is so big, but I won't forget it. We'll we'll keep it stored, which uh, which was an interesting one. That's not to say that Davy hasn't given the big one when Wexford have gotten goals down through the years and gotten in people's faces. He definitely he definitely has, and he had some interesting comments on Brian Cody as well. And like, listen, by the way, Wexford won't get far enough for them to store it up this year. Wexford no. aren't going to get far enough to, to play Kilkenny. If Kilkenny win, maybe I'd be proven wrong on that. Will I be proven wrong on that? Or Kilkenny going to win the Leinster final and then Wexford have an unbelievably long route to get back that far? It's hard, it's hard to see a chain, to be honest with you. So if he's keeping it stored, he's maybe sending subliminal messages that he's definitely going to be involved next year. But just what he said on Brian Cody as well, we've talked about you know, the word in Kilkenny about Brian Cody being under pressure and some uh, archaic uh, methods and different things like that. Davey just said, people said to me, Brian Cody's time in Kilkenny is up and they need some fresh blood. That's the biggest load of rubbish I've ever heard in my life. If Kilkenny people are thinking that, they need to have another look at themselves. What he's done is incredible. He's building a new team and he's got he's going again. Listen, every other team would be delighted if Brian went. You can't beat knowledge and experience. Listen, there's definitely a lot of old school methods to Brian Cody. And maybe the, the way he deals with people and players is would be seen quite old school in, in some quarters. But he has definitely modernised his tactics. They 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 allowed t- Wexford had the ball maybe for the first 15, 20 minutes. That didn't work from the puck out. Then they pushed up, started turning over puck outs, made Wexford go along. 
So like he's definitely modernized. He wasn't able to deal with the sweeper before. Now he's shown that he kind of can deal with it. And just a quick one on Davy and, and Cody. Like this is one of the great managerial rivalries. I think it's mm. two wins, two losses and a draw uh, over the five championship games since Davy took over Wexford. And you're nearly guaranteed an absolute barn burner every time they play. And it's, it, it, that's what you love. You love those type of rivalries, the county rivalry and the manager rivalry, obviously, as well. Do you think it counted against Wexford that they played Leach the week beforehand? So for whatever you get out of sharpness, Lee Chin played 66 minutes. Rory O'Connor played 70 minutes. You know, some of these, some of these players that maybe they could have done with a break, maybe like Dermot O'Keefe did come off with 20 minutes to go. But I remember even Lee Chin, didn't he have a little blow on his leg towards the end of the game? Yeah. And he, he went through a lot of physical contact in this game. I think Paddy Deegan was probably, you know, that was a tasty enough one when he, when he took him out when Lee Chin was soloing through into, into the hill end at one stage over the course of the game. But players like Chin... And understandably so. I mean, I remember tweeting when it went into extra time, you couldn't criticise any player for making a mistake at this stage because what they're after going through, they're, they're physically spent. You look down and you saw, like I remember looking at Lee Mogue McGovern, who'd had an unbelievable game thinking, this lad has nothing else left to give. And ultimately, plenty of lads didn't have anything left to give. And Dermot O'Keefe didn't have anything left to give. Lee Chin, I can't imagine how tired he still is after that game. Conor MacDonald did brilliantly to stay going. The other side... I mean, looking at the players that started, TJ Reid had a brilliant, um, he had a brilliant matchup with Matt O'Hanlon. And, you know, you'd pay money to watch that. But as the game went on, his influence grew and he got three points just uh, through normal time. He obviously got a point as well in extra time. He won a few frees. He's setting up play. And I think he's changing his game. And we talked about this before. That, you know, when you're, you're going to be 34 later this year, you're not going to be as pacey as you were at 27. But now he's getting the ball and you just see him arcing around and just looking to see who can pass it to. Yeah. That's, so, but he's not always turning and sprinting straight to goal and analysing who can I give this to for a goal. It's almost like he gets the ball but he's back to goal and he's kind of thinking, well, obviously he turns as well towards goal. Who can I feed this to? Who can I create from? And he, he's just so good at that. And then we obviously have to talk about Owen Cody. This is the day that the King Henry's son, uh, nephew has landed. Like, what a performance. Oh, brilliant performance. And I think uh, TJ is clever enough to realise as well that, you know, if Matt O'Hanlon's going to follow him, that that should create openings for other guys somewhere else and allow others to flourish. And it's probably a kind of a selfless role that he's playing there at times as well. Definitely allow Cody to flourish. Remember, there was a couple of really lovely diagonal balls into Cody and he just looked um, so much more assured on the ball uh, on Saturday evening, maybe compared to a different stage of last year when he panicked. And even during the league, when he was brilliant in one of the games, we hit four or five wides, I think, in, in, in the first half. But he was brilliant and just took that goal uh, so clinically as well. And yeah, that's probably the day that he came of age. They needed, we've talked about, they need other guys to step up and fill the breach. And in fairness, it was on Cody uh, on Saturday. Maybe it'll be Billy Ryan, maybe it'll be Adrian Mullen the next day, but they need those other guys to chip in. If those other guys chip in, Kilkenny will be a really, really tough nut to crack. Mm, some of the other players who came in and made a difference, I thought James Maher, he came in and, and it was certainly marking Lee Chin for quite a while and he's got the pace for him I think he was like a very good underage runner I might be not sure if I'm 100% right on that um, he was very good James Bergen came in this is a lad who he's kind of been in and out of the team he was whipped off early against Wexford in a league game where they were winning well and go good ball was going into him he made his impact here scoring two points off the bench uh, Connor Fogarty he, he was named to start and then, and then he came on and he got a point for himself Wally Walsh was 1-1 and people would probably be thinking that OK, Wally he, himself and Colin Penley, who isn't on the panel this year, maybe he'll start to be nudged out of the team. And he, he obviously has really reminded Cody what he can do. I was surprised that John Donnelly wasn't started, I have to say, that he was taken out of the starting team. Who knows, maybe there was an injury there. It's hard to get the information at times. But um, I'm surprised he wasn't started. I, like, what impressed you most about, about Kilkenny in this game? Ah, um, it's just the same thing that usually impresses me, Shane, is the honesty that you know you know what you're going to get out of them on a, on any given day. Really, uh, they just it's just something unreal when they put on that black and amber jersey for, for on a Brian Cody team that they just do almost raise their. It's like they puff out their puff out their chest a bit, put their shoulders back, and they just can find another level. Um, it's a, it's a, it is amazing reading. There was no. There was no Richie Hogan on Saturday. I believe he was at the he was at the Irish Open there for a couple of days over the weekend. He didn't didn't feature at all over the weekend. So 
not too sure exactly what his uh, what his situation is at the moment. But if he's all all of a sudden back in the equation for Leinster final, it's another option, probably an option off the bench realistically. But uh, this is kind of a new Kilkenny team. Like I thought, Tommy Walsh and Paddy Deegan, Hugh Lawler were brilliant in the full back line, and I've had questions about the full back line. Still have questions about the midfield. Richie Latty was pulled off early. Killian Buckley came in, didn't have too much of an impact. They're probably still looking for a midfield partnership there. But yeah, listen, they're, like after everyone saying there was so much pressure on Cody, they're seventy minutes away from more silverware and back to back Leinster titles. You know, so it's, yeah, they're 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 not they're not gone. I still don't think they can win in All Ireland, but they're not gone. Yeah, yeah, fair point. So, anything else there that uh, that you want us to touch on? Let us know. Just a comment from Brian White, TJ Reid. What a hurler! How anyone thinks Tony Kelly is a better hurler than him is mad. So, obviously, we did our top ten hurlers at the moment. We put Tony Kelly number one. TJ Reid came in at number two. We talked it uh, high and low, but I still think after Kelly's performance at the weekend, that's not necessarily enough reason to change it around. But no. The enduring legacy of Reid is there, all right. Martin Furlong, if Wexford can repeat this performance consistently, Wexford could do well in the back door. However, consistency has never been our friend. To be fair, it's not like they were bad. They were very, very good. They did run out of steam, and the question has to be asked, should lads who have already shown that they're spent and were cramping be brought back on a, onto the field? And what does that say to the rest of your panel? And what does it say about your opinion of the rest of your panel? That definitely can't be ignored. Just to, fi uh, to finish out on this before before we move on to the other games, 27 scorers, 70 scores, 119 scoring chances. I mean, how do you analyze that? Very, very difficult. And um, obviously, there's no qualifier draw this morning as well, so we, we will be Which is a bit more. mad, Shane. They could, have, they could have really done the qualifier draw mm. and even had an either or, and then th at least we know what the fixtures are and managers can start preparing for who's next. Yeah, okay. So uh, just a reminder, it, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. If you want to get any of the great retro jerseys, go to their website and use the promo code OURGAME for 15% off. And if you want to get this on audio podcast, go to Patreon and join the Supporters Club. So the Joe McDonough over the weekend, Westmead, they had a 23 points to 18 win over Carlo. Obviously, no Mouth Cavanagh there. He's after suffering an injury and he'll probably be out for the, the full year. Down had a massive win over Mead, 127 to 216. So um, so plenty of moving and shaking going on in the Joe McDonough. Yeah, a big finishing kick from Westmead, in fairness. Carlo were in a good position uh, with 10 or 15 to go, and he scored a handful of points at the end. And in fairness, Killian Doyle and I think Derek Clinton came on as well, and Josh Cole came on from Westmead, made a massive difference. Uh, funnily enough, Carlo are not out of it yet. If Kildare were to beat Westmead next week, which isn't beyond the realms of possibility, it will be a three-way tie, and I, I'm assuming it goes to score difference to see who would be in the final. Westmead need to not uh, not leave any chance for funny business or anything there and just get a result next weekend, but that's not a foregone conclusion. Uh, and the other side of it then, uh, downbeat Mead, as, as expected, uh, it's very hard to see anything but Kerry been in the final already. Kerry are playing Mead in their last game, and uh, like on, on the all-known form, should be at least seven or eight too good for Mead. And then just going down to the Christy Ring Cup, really, really tight game between Derry and Roscommon. Didn't think this would be as tight as it was. 19 points for Derry, 115 for Roscommon, just a point between it. That means that uh, Derry are in a good position to avoid Offaly potentially until the Christy Ring Cup final. Offaly, the big win against Sligo, 239 to 217. But scores can be really deceiving at times. Sligo were like were level after 20 minutes and it was only five or six points in it with 20 minutes to go. It was really the finishing uh, the finishing quarter from Offaly that kicked it off. My own club, my own cattle got, I think it was 15, 12 frees. Brian Dyden got six and Liam Langton got five. Uh, Jero Kelly Lynch was absolutely outstanding for Sligo. I think it was 214 he ended up with. Uh, a dual star at different stages over the last couple of years. He was brilliant. Uh, I'm obviously wearing the... The Mayo jersey, Mayo have uh, have one foot uh, in the in the Nicky Racker Cup final. I think after a big win against uh, Leitrim, twenty nine points to nine. Uh, like that's basically like a Laurie Mara Cup team essentially coming up against a really good Nicky Racker Cup team. And then in the other Nicky Racker Cup playoff, uh, Tyrone one eighteen, Armagh one sixteen. That's a big result. Um, Damien Casey brilliant again for Tyrone. But Armagh would have fancied them chances, would have fancied their chances there. And I know you have a bit of insight into the Laurie Mara Cup. Uh, uh, Cavan won 16 for Mana 17 points and then the other result there down there are loud the reigning champions 315 Mana and 16 so Carl McIrlain the, the fantasy hurling that IE guru will be no doubt disappointed he reckoned I was building him up for a fall the other day I most certainly was not because I was, I was hoping they'd win but I think Andrew Macken was back 
for Loud and he got two goals. So uh, just it's so important to to highlight those games as well. I was at the Leinster minor final at the weekend too. Kilkenny two twenty one, Offaly three nine. Again, I think the scoreboard was a bit flattering to Kilkenny. We missed an awful lot of chances. Uh, a couple of players that stood out for Kilkenny, Billy Drennan, wing forward, an All Ireland handball champion. He was absolutely outstanding. And uh, Kilkenny had Z- a fellow with the name of Zach Bay Hammond, corner back, an absolute beast. And he was bursting out with ball after ball and kind of tied down some of our danger men at different times. So, just so important to all those games get exposure. Like, it was a massive, massive weekend. And it's very easy for the big games to dominate, but so much really good hurling, even outside the top tier as well. Yeah, and I was uh, in that Cavan game that you're talking about there. I was telling uh, Brian Fitzgerald, who's a, a cooler player and married to a Cavan woman, that he needs to deliver uh, the Cavan GA Twitter account. They were fairly celebrating him. So in that 116 to 17 points win over Fermanagh, he's obviously after doing okay. So that's him after buying a week of me not. Uh, <laughs> and also in Group A, of course, like as you talked about, Loud, they had that win over Monaghan. So Monaghan will face Longford next, and that'll be. You could end up with a three-way tie there as well because Longford and Louth are on two points each. And Monaghan, if they could manage to get that win over uh, Longford, they'd, they'd, all the teams would be uh, matched up nicely then on two points each. So that's it for the Hurling Show this weekend. Uh, you always have to take a break, don't you? You nearly have to take might. a breath and recharge again. Absolutely. Right, that's it. Brought to you by OgreRetro.com. If you want to get 10% off or 15% off the jerseys, use the promo code OurGame. And don't forget to join the Supporters Club on Patreon. Thanks very much, Michael. We'll get you again. Cheers, Shane. Thanks, Mel.